So my name is Tom Wickham Jones and I work at Wolfram Research. My talk is Advances in the Wolfram Compiler and I'm going to be talking about the latest advances in the Wolfram Compiler, you know, for the upcoming version and some lots of interesting things to do with compilation of the Wolfram language. So my name's Tom Wickham Jones um, and I want to talk about advances in the Wolfram compiler. So, the Wolfram compiler, it's a compiler for the Wolfram language. This is a long-term project. I give a, I'm giving a talk every year at the conferences, at conferences about this, but I think it's really starting to become more um, concrete and more, more useful. But this is a long-term project and it's not finished. It's entirely built in the Wolfram language and I think now, I think there's, there's over 100,000 lines of code. I think this is one of the largest projects. Wolfram Alpha is bigger, but sometimes I tell the people that work on Wolfram Alpha, it's just the same function written many times. And the compiler is, is uh, abstracted, so we only write functions once. No, that's, um, it, it's a large Wolfram language project. One of the goals is to leverage latest knowledge, you know, mathematical, scientific knowledge about compiler technology, and also use the latest technology that's, 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 that's available as much as possible. Um, version 1 of the compiler was released in Mathematica 12, and just at the moment we're just finalizing testing to add the compiler to the, to the cloud. So in this talk, I'm going to, I want to introduce the compiler. Some of you have come to talks about the compiler previously. Some of you have not. I'm not, I, hopefully I won't bore the people that have seen this before, but I won't rush over things for the people that haven't. I want to show some of the latest advantages. I want to show a new feature that we've adding to version 12.1 called data structure that's, a, that's built from the compiler. I'll show a little bit of compiler technology, benefits of working in the Wolfram language, and I'm going to show some interesting, innovative programming patterns and techniques that, that, that you can use with this technology. So, compiler basics, what's the idea? Convert Wolfram language code into native machine code, and this is done with adding type annotations to the Wolfram functions, and there's an inferencing, a type inferencing system. Type inferencing is a huge, fascinating topic that, in a sense, we're just touching a corner of it, but that's, that's, that's what we're doing. Some of the benefits of this, a lot of people, they want to get faster execution. That's, that's important, but there's other aspects. You get a guarantee, you get some guarantees of correctness. If your code is not correct, if you're doing something that it doesn't understand, it gets rejected at a compilation phase. So what we're doing is we're turning runtime errors, which are bad, into compile time errors, which are also bad, but they're easier to fix because the developer of the code sees the compile time errors, whereas the user of the code, who might not be the developer, sees the runtime errors. Um, with this, you can build features that can't be done in, in, in the regular Wolfram language. This is a powerful and new way to connect to external code. Fahim showed a nice example of doing that. You can make special app standalone applications target special hardware. So, quick basic demonstration. We have a function, like a regular Lambda, you know, anonymous function in Mathematica, and it has arguments, but these arguments are given type annotations. We run it in function compile, and we get back this compiled code function that you give it, give it the input, and you get the answer. Well, very boring. And let me tell you, for several years, this was the only function that we compiled, and, and people were getting very frustrated. Oh, come on, can't you do more than that? But, you know, working in compilers, you, it, you build things up. Yes, yes. Anyway, so that's the... Now, what is supported? So, core native types, so integers, reals, complexes, but also we support all the different sizes 
that are also present in numeric array. So this is a nice way to work with what's, what's in numeric array. You know, unsigned integer 8 bytes or, you know, integer 64 or real 32. And, and you can go down to, like, these real 16s, which, which are important for um, 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 some, some machine learning operations. Packed arrays, so with all the tensor operations. So what's new that's not like the older compiler is we, we, we support, you know, programming functions like map and fold and stuff, but we also support functions as a first-class object. So you can pass functions into as arguments or return functions as results, and we're, you know, also, you, try not to be too technical, but functions that capture other data from outside their environment. Those are called closures. It's important. We also provide a callback mechanism to the Wolfram evaluator. So there's a way of seeing what people say what's supported. We actually maintain a function that probes the system, and these are func the list of current functions that are known in some way to the compiler. These are the system context symbols. Of course, there's lots of internal functions, you know, that, you know, things that we, that, that we use to build the compiler, and that's a much bigger list. Um, right. And examples. Actually, the dot pages, the marketing pages that Roger was talking about, have some not unuseful, some quite useful, interesting um, examples. What we don't have yet is a nice tutorial uh, we have a big internal tutorial that we maintain, and I think that should be um, sort of broken out. Now, when you use function compile, you get back a compile code function. You can execute this straight away. I'm not going into the details of how that works. It's quite interesting, though. Um, you can make other things. So this is an important um, output mechanism, and this is function compile, but I'm exporting into a library. On my Mac, that makes a dilib. Um, the advantage of that is, and I can load the dilib, and I get my compiled code function that I can use. You know, it works just like if I did function compile. The advantage of this is you don't need to run the compiler to get the compiled code function. In fact, you don't even need to have the compiler installed on your machine. It comes with Mathematica, so that's not really an issue. But that's a key benefit, because you compile it once, and you can use it many times. And it's optimally fast. Constantine. Can you have one function in a library? No, you, you can have, I'll be showing examples of that. You can have many. Uh, Itai. If you send it to someone with a Mac running 12.1, it will work. Okay. If you send it to someone with a Mac running 1.0, it won't work. <laughs> right. But you'll, you'll get, it, well, first of all, this is using library, library link. This is a hybrid file. So if library link exists, you'll be able to load it, but you'll get a warning telling you about a, a, you know, a mismatch. So that, that's a complicated question that, um, yeah. Let's, I want to keep going. Now, excuse me? Hold on. <laughs> right. So this is some, some other output. So I can generate, there's this function compile export string, and this is generating a, um, generating a, um, this, this LLVM internal code, that uh, it's, this is a little bit like an assembler, or it's a little bit like C with fixed types, but it's written in this slightly strange um, way that's, that's actually incredibly useful, um, that's part of the LLVM tools. Um, and here I've generated assembler. This is generating assembler for my architecture, but I can generate um, output. So here I can generate the output for it's loading some stuff for Windows. So I could compile this for and make an object file 
for Windows. So that's an object file. You'd still have to link it. I can't make a library. I can't make a DLL on this machine. I, I, I mean, that's, that's a, you know, there are ways of doing that, but that's not a workflow that we've optimized. You can, make, you can compile object files for a variety of platforms. So I, I just did that for Windows 32, you know, win, Windows 32-bit. And in fact, it's even known, even though we, the function was defined, okay, well, it's, it's, it's written. If I, right, it's, it's, made a, a, it's made something for Windows. Now, here are some of the challenges that we face in, in this. And these are things that people, sometimes they just think, well, you know, it's not obvious, you know, well, what's, what's, you know, what's the big deal? So I've written a function here that adds two integers. And I'm giving it an integer that I've chosen specially. I'm adding zero to it, and I get an answer. Now, if I call the same function, and I add this specially chosen integer, and I add one to it, I actually get an error, but I get a result. The, the error, for some in the style sheet, it's not, but it's saying there's integer overflow. So what's, what's going on here? So first of all, there was an error, and, and this particular invocation defaults to using the old evaluator, so you still get a result. You can configure that sometimes. If things error out, you don't want, you know, you just want it to terminate, but this, by default, Function compile doesn't do that. So what's, what's going on? Let's look at the signature of the function. And this is integer 64. Two integer 64. The result is an integer 64. So the, this is the input, 2 to the 63 minus 1. If I increase that, so whoops. Yeah, if I, if I just do this, this is no longer, this is the result I was generating. It's no longer a machine integer. It's over, it's flowed out of the range of, of um, things. So why, so we've got code that checks that you're, that you're doing that. If you write a C++ program, you don't get this. This does not happen. So why, and in fact, if you want the C++ behavior, you can incompile, you can use this thing, unchecked block. So I wrap, wrap unchecked block around it, and now I get an unchecked, Plus, so it works in the same way, like we see there. So that's that's all fine, but of course, if I do the thing that overflows, oh my gosh, it's gone from a positive number to a negative number. Now, for those of you who understand two's complement, you say, but it's worse than that because in the C C++ standards, this operation is undefined. So actually, it's not, you can't even rely on it. Unsigned integers, you, you, it's defined that they, they wrap around. But for these integers, it's, it's, it's undefined. And compilers, this is a common source of coding errors that programmers make, is they rely on operations, signed integer operations wrapping around but the compile. It's not defined behavior, and the compilers might behave differently. You know, the compilers are not required to support undefined behavior, obviously. So this is some of the challenges that we face. Doing this validated arithmetic is actually surprisingly, again, that's an interesting detail of compilers. It, it's actually surprising that it, it, it's quite fast, actually. So, but still, that's, that's, that, these are choices that, that, that you have to make. Um, right. So here's, here's another thing. This is some newer things. So I've, I'm now, I've got a function, and I'm giving it a Boolean, and I'm doing, you know, not of the argument, and then calling the sign function on it. Now, if Michael Trott was here, he'd tell me some algebra where this makes perfect sense and everything. But it, the sign function that the compiler knows about doesn't know what to do with Booleans. And um, we get an error message. Actually, this error message is not... Super, I, I have a div we're, we're working to make the error message make even more sense. But what you do get out of it now from this failure object that comes back from compile, you can ask for the source of the failure, and this tells you what it was that gave the error. And these sorts of things are quite useful. Here, here's another um, example of some code. 
that, that I've written. So I've got a local variable y, and I'm initializing it, but I'm initializing it in a branch. So when it comes down to this one, not all ways to reach this branch has the variable y been initialized. So when we compile this, we get an error that tells us this. And again, the, the, the error is not useful, but we're I, I, actually, I can't show you this today, but soon it will say y was in uninitialized, but we tell us the source. And actually, since we started adding these, the, these are quite useful. And when you write Wolfram language code, you actually see a surprising number of these. These are sources of error in your code. Right, yes? The source is what it was doing that caused the error. It's the sub part of the program that caused the error. Right, it doesn't, when we get Brenton's tools hooked up, it'll give more information like a line number or, 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 or something. So yes, that's, that's right. So another thing you can do, yeah, yeah, could, could we maybe have not too many Wolfram research questions because I've got a lot of material to go through and you have other opportunities. So you have like two questions each and Etai, right. <laughs> so, so, sorry Etai, but uh, yeah. No, of course not. No, it would be completely happy. That's that's the that's what you should do. Yes, right. So good. So, so sorry, Itai, but I, wait, I'll ask you a question. Go on. That's a right. That's that's a complicated question because right. The, Okay, this, right, right. The answer is, it depends upon the context. If you were again going to use that sign of integers with a real number, it will actually succeed to work it, and it will numericalize that particular input. So this is one of the things that I've been very proud of that I think we handle incredibly well when you mix exact arithmetic, exact quantities with inexact things. And so in, technically, that means it's known to the type system, but we don't provide an implementation, and there's a pass that optimizes these, which is actually is quite a useful pass. So this means that we correctly, we have a place in the future if we chose to support these things in the compiled language, but we don't get incorrect answers now. So I think that's, and I talked to Mark carefully to try and make sure that I dealt with these things in, in, in appropriate ways. So it's the same as if you put pi or E or, or mathematical constants in, into the program, and those are also dealt with, 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 with correctly. Right. Another thing you can do is you can, I'm, I'm not going to show too much, but there's a lot of options for tuning your code for performance. When you're doing this, you're trading compilation time for ex and execution time. You might be willing to, you know, spend more time compiling if, if, if you're going to get faster code. So we have a bunch of Wolfram optimizations that we've built in, and then we're sitting on top of the LLVM system, and that has another huge swath of, of, of optimizations. The Wolfram optimizations are useful because they know about our language. LLVM does not know about our language, but, but we do. So we can write special optimizations that are good for what we are doing. Um, some other optimizations you can do are like turning off things. So you can turn off the validated arithmetic. That can help in some ways um, at a risk. Another thing that you can do is that we insert code to do abort handling. So if you can do like, you know, command period to abort your, you can turn that off. And in some cases that can help. Now, if you just want to leave your code running, you don't want to abort it, and then you go off and come back, you know, two days later, that is is useful. If you're working and you want to run dynamic and things like that, it is bad. By, by default, the abort handling is wrong. These are choices that, that, that you have, and I hope we've made sensible defaults. Right, keep going. So, good. Now, I've really got to keep going. So, um, new way, this is a powerful new way to call external code. It's, it's quite simple, so I can declare, here I'm adding to the type environment, I'm declaring a function, 
and I'm saying it's known in an external library. Maybe in the external library it has a different name, so we can map, and I'm giving it a type. So then I would, I'm, I'm not going to execute this, but then I would call the function, write a function that used it, and then when I compiled it, I would add external libraries goes to lib. If this is a library that's already linked into the Wolfram kernel, you don't need to do this external libraries. But, so that's quite, quite interesting. Right, fine. Let's keep going. New features coming out in 12.1. So a major new feature we're calling type product. This is part of a set of things that people would call as algebraic data types. And this is, there's another thing, a type product is like a, um, it's like a product, it's like a struct or record, and there's another thing which, is, which, which will be called type sum, which is like a union, and the two things fit together quite ni nicely. Um, we've implemented the first part of this, and this, this has a lot of interesting um, potential. So here's an example. So I'm declaring a type product. I've given it a name, and I'm saying it has a field, F1 that's an integer and a field F2 that's a real, and then I can compile this. And this is a supremely boring function that is um, creating an object, then pulling the fields out and adding them. Really dull. But you can do more than that if you start to add. So here I'm adding some an, an attribute, or I'm saying implements to a new um, thing, and I'm saying this is expression boxed. So boxing in many languages means that you wrap something around it. Expression boxing of a type product means I can return it to the evaluator. So let's see what that means. So here I'm creating an instance of this um, you know, product, and then I'm writing a function, and I'm returning this. When I call this, it comes back up to the, 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 the evaluator. So, so what's in this can be anything, anything I want. Um, and then I can write other functions if the front end occasionally it's done something really nasty. It's There we go, right. This is, this is very annoying. It was really there. And anyway, I've, I've got the thing here. Right, so now I'm writing a function that takes one of these things, and this is getting, getting the field. So I've compiled that, and I pass in the thing, and because I put 10 up there, I get 10 down there. So I can get write getters and setters, and I can write more complicated functions. So there's a lot more stuff to this. We can add more attributes, you know, that suddenly make it do work with memory management and such like. We use this type product. This is a nice way to create data structures. And we've written a whole bunch of these data structures and made a slicker, nicer feature for 12.1. This is the data structure feature that Stephen showed in his talk. Um, at the moment, we've implemented a bunch of these. And I'll just show you this one here called, oh, I'm not doing too badly on top. Right, this is an array list, so I, can, so I can append, so I've appended a bunch of things to this array list. I can look at the, I can just get the stuff that's in there. I can get information. This is, I think I've got this. Stephen wanted this, and actually, it's quite nice, actually. I can get a visualization. Visualization is a little bit tiny, but this is showing. These, these visualizations are quite useful for explaining what they are and also seeing how they are behaving. So um, that's the array list. I can get parts and I can mutate parts. So I'm assigning to the second part. So if I come and look at the normal, now I've, you know, originally this was two and now it's become f of four. So, key point about data structure is it's pre-compiled. We ship this in the version. The compiler, a weakness of the compiler at the moment is it's quite slow to compile. I'll talk about that. But data structure, it's pre-compiled into libraries. So we just ship the library with 
the product and you don't, you don't run the compiler to use them. It, 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 it doesn't even touch the compiler if, you know, to, to use the built-in, the, the operations that we've, we've built in. Um, key part about data structures, the, many of the data structures, though not necessarily all of them, they are uh, mutable. So like this array list is, I can append to it. So here's a list and I'm calling append to, and I'm doing this 20,000 times and it took six seconds. I do the same operation on my machine and it's mutating the thing. Now there's consequences to this, so, but um, anyway, or I can do the same thing, I can update parts and that's also. Now, in the system, in Mathematica langu Wolfram language, we, for updating parts, we have a very complicated mechanism that tries to look at reference counts and avoids that, but it often goes wrong and it has the unintended consequence of making your code suddenly it's not running in linear time, it's running in quadratic time, and this is a bad thing if you're doing a big calculation. Um, so this, this thing here is, is is useful, you, you, you can start using it. I, I think there's some possibility that we could start analyzing more from code and we could see, oh, you're doing a pend in a loop. Let's lift that, let's rewrite your code automatically, lift that out, turn it into an array list and then turn it back out of one. And those sorts of things can be quite, quite useful, maybe with some hints or something. So that's the um, value of um, array list and also we support so here's a, I made an array list, and we support functional operations. So I can do, you know, like fold or something or, you know, whatever. So this is just these, these functional operations, fold, map, whatever we want. Now, another feature of these is that they're built with the compiler, and they completely seamlessly integrate with the compiler, and this is a great way to add functionality. So... I've got, you know, someone says, oh, you know, I want, I want reverse for my array list. And, you know, we probably will add reverse, but supposing we hadn't added reversed, what are we going to do? So we'll, we'll write it, and this, this implementation of a reverse is probably how you would write it if you didn't have reverse. You'd probably write something like this. You, you, you might well do. So we can write that. It would execute at top level, but we can then compile it. And now, when we, when we write it, you know, here's, here's our thing, and it, it runs. So that's quite nice. What I think is very exciting about this is the way that we are writing it is the way that users can write things. So we're breaking this gulf, this barrier between there's some secret internal way that we write things and there's some other way that people write things. There's just one way, so everyone is a developer. So, you know, that's, that's a good thing. And so you, we can extend things and add things and, and such like. So that's, that's kind of a nice, nice feature. So, okay. Here's another, I'm now writing some compiled code, going back to actually using the compiler. And here I've got the, um, right, so I'm, I've got a little program, and this is, I'm creating a new array list, and then I'm going to append integers into this. So the, um, what, do we, what, what do we have here? So we create this. So this is not the sort of fancy expression array list that has, this is a, a sort of, slightly rawer type of data structure. We still get this useful way of working at it, but this is a different thing. The signature of this is this is not a array list of expressions where you can put arbitrary symbolic things into this. This is an array list that only takes integers. If you try and append a Boolean or a real, you would do that in compiled code. Your code will not compile. So that's an important point. Another aspect of this is that it means that we can create versions of array list for specific individual types. That's called poly, we only have one implementation, 
but we instantiate it for different types. That's, that's called polymorphism, and it's a powerful way to, um, for, for things to work. So, now, just to go back to data structure, at present, in 12.1, we've implemented, you know, a bunch of things, um, you know, a bunch of sets. We have, for example, a hash set. So this is a, a set, I mean a set in the sense of a collection of distinct objects, where distinction is computed by hashing. So if they hash differently, they're different. Uh, well, no, no, they, it uses a hash to, as, as a pre-selector, and then it uses the same queue to, 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 to distinguish. And we have a, a hash table. We intend for near future means 12.1 to implement more, some more things. And yeah, it's great fun. You know, I'm chatting to people. I chatted to Brenton. He said, you know, he really likes DQ. So fine, let's, let's, let's make a DQ. Because it's, and actually adding these things is quite, because we share a lot of code, it's quite easy to, 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 to add these. Some of them, they start to get a bit more, you know, tries and things, super useful. But I think this is, this is useful. I am super interested if there anyone has particular data structures that they may have experience of from other, you know, talk to me and we can, you know, we'll get them in a, get them in a pipeline. Right, now, let's keep going. Yes, I'm not doing too badly. I can get some more questions from Wolfram people. Turn on Wolfram people mode. Um, right, Constantine. So, of which? Um, well, it depends what it depends what the data structure is. In fact, the um, function pages for the data structures describe the complexity, or the sometimes the complexity is a slightly complicated. You know, it's is it best case, worst case. You know, but it it, it does describe. So, for the for the array list, it, it's it's. Um, constant time to an, an element lookup. For a linked list, a pending and prepending is constant time, but element lookup is, is, is order n. So, yeah. Um, so, the, I noticed with your data structure, you've got like append as an actual argument in the data structure, instead of the data structure being an argument to append. Because it's not the same, the, these functions are not, it doesn't have all the functionality of the built-in function. I, I, the current thinking is not to do that because it doesn't have all of the functionality and arguments and things of, of, of the thing. So, right. Yep. Yes? Well, association, do you mean association? I mean, you're, you're asking an internal question about... I, I, th I think it's, well, again, the, the hash table in the kernel is, well, it, it, it's this sort of pseudo-complicated polymorphic, so it depends what it's instantiated for. For the similar things, it, it might be better because these things here are instantiated for particular types, whereas the one in the kernel is some pseudo-object-oriented void star function technique which has fewer opportunities for inlining. If we rewrote the internal one in templates, then, then they might be more similar. But you know, I'm, I'm not sure that we, we need to do that. So okay? Maybe the answer is, if <coughs> this one is slower, then we can easily optimize yes, the that's it. it's harder to optimize. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's the nice thing about developing our own compiler is we can, we can we fix it, we study things, and we fix them. And we spend a lot of time looking at other languages. You know, how does Rust do this? You know, oh yeah, that's, oh, that's, oh they're, they're doing that, so we shouldn't feel bad about doing that. Or, oh, that's a good idea. Or, oh, they're not, oh, we're, we're better than them. So, you know, but it, it's, it's important to study these things. Right, now I'm gonna switch gear from data structure and look at some um, internals of the compiler. Again, I'm going to be you know, somewhat brief um, and right. So we have um, we have a pipeline 
So we start out with Wolfram language, Wolfram language code, and we sort of operate on it with you know, a macro system. We then turn it into this sort of internal, you know, an alternative way of looking at um, programs that's suitable for compilation um, that I'll, 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 I'll talk about a little bit. We add type inference, we do type inferencing, we do more transformations and optimizations, and then we generate executables. Uh, yes? What, what part of these steps is processed by the Wolf language in the kernel? So in the way I think about the kernel... The last one is not. Well, everything else is done, is everything else is done with Wolfram language code. The last step is done by LLVM. Yeah. So that immediate, is that IR is some sort of, is We, we, we have a, we have a, I'll, I'll show, why don't I, I'll, I'll show some of this. So, right. So. So this is the sort of pipeline that, that we go through. And we, we make this modular pipeline where we run transformation passes on the individual, um, you know, on the individual thing. And, and it's a great opportunity for abstraction. And one of the philosophies that we have is rather than having a pass be super complicated to do lots of things, if there's a common thing in it, we lift that out and we put it in another pass. So these passes are often very simple. And, you know, sometimes you run a pass and then you have to fix up the types. So rather than having, you know, 10 passes, each of which fix up the types individually, we, we just run the type fix up pass after each one of these. And this philosophy is super useful because it means we can improve the way we fix up types without having to go to 10 different places and, and you know, sort of in, and, and improve all of them. So we have a lot of these passes and, you know, some, some of these, if people have graph theory background, there's tons of graph theory in, in this and, you know, optimizations, you know, and things, you know, all sorts of things. Here's a pass that inserts um, code to deal with aborts and, uh, you know, here's, you know, optimizations, et cetera, like that. There's, there's about 200 of these. So we don't run all of those all the time. An interesting idea sometime is to use machine, le machine learning to try to figure out some optimal stream of optimization passes. So we, we haven't done that yet. So, LLVM. Wolfram Compiler uses LLVM as a back end. So what is LLVM? LLVM is a compiler infrastructure um, that has developed from initially a, a sort of pedagogical tool down the road here at U of I into what is now a large collection of compilers and for working with different input languages and different output targets. So the thing that's nice about it, it has a very nice architecture that you can learn from because um, it's a set of reusable components and it's well designed for extension. It has this well-defined intermediate representation that, that I was showing you, and that's similar to the representation that we use. Um, a lot of people, they haven't heard of LLVM. Some people, especially if they do C++ development on the Mac, they use, they've heard of Clang. <coughs> so Clang's the compiler that you get on Macs. So Clang is built from LLVM. You can run Clang on, on Linux machines. You can run Clang on, on Windows. And in fact, Microsoft have, what's, what's happening now is a lot of companies like Microsoft are starting to incorporate these tools into their, into their systems. There's a lot of tools that work with LLVM, things like debuggers and code transformers, profilers. And one, one thing that's super interesting is that now... A lot of people, when they're working with, you know, exotic hardwares, you know, this WebAssembly thing, which is this weird assembler code that lives in web browsers, or, or GPUs. GPUs have been around for a long time, but now most GP, you know, certainly the NVIDIA tools are all, they, they just use LLVM because they, they have a nice architecture that, that they can fit into, and they don't have, you know, they don't have to reinvent 
many, many things. Um, FGPAs, so it's another emerging technology which, you know, is very LLVM dependent. The super exciting thing for us, I'll answer your question, I'll just make a quick point. Super exciting thing for us is that since LLVM works with these things, that means we, work, we have the potential to work with all these things. And we've done some work, not quite finished. We were try, hoping to get some GPU functionality of just literally writing like a CUDA map where you write your function, you know, not, not writing in CUDA, but writing your function and making a program that will then go to run on the GPU. We did, it's, you know, GP, even with the help from our compiler, well, when we've done the work with our compiler, it'll be very easy, but while we're building that, it's, it's, it's quite challenging to, 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 to make such things. I think that's super interesting. Maybe next year we'll, 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 we'll show some, 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 some examples of that. Was, was that your question? Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Excuse me? The, the which? AMD GPUs. AMD GPUs, right. So. How do you program those? What, what, what's the technology? I don't think there's a viable technology to program those. Well, here's Mecca. What's that thing? Mecca. That's for programming graphics. No. It's not done. It's not done. Uh, metal, metal has been extended for oh, GPUs. Yeah. Right, right. Compute compiler and a mesh shell. Well, if, if it. Windows, I guess, select a 12 or something. Mm -hmm. but, right, right. But for the CUDA ones, that's, that's quite, because that, you can run CUDA GPUs on many, plat on, you know, different platforms, and they are, you know, that, that, you, know you, you can build CUDA programs on Windows or Mac or, or Linux. So it is a bit more, a bit broader. Yes? Well, the, the AMD things, if there's an LLVM solution for it, it's quite straightforward. If there is not an LLVM solution for it, it's not impossible, but it's, it's much more work. Well, I'm, I'm not saying it's not a priority, but I'm going to work on the, you know, I mean, first of all, NVIDIA GPUs are very dominant, okay? You know, our machine learning functionality, that's, that's, that works on... Yeah, so, but that's, that's, that's what we're going to focus on is the you know, the common things that are easy to work on. So, right. I'll keep going. Um, right, so I was just talking about LLVM. Type framework, I'm not going to, this is also super interesting. I'm not going to talk about this, this a whole lot, other than say it, it provides it's static typing. You do a typing pass at code processing time. It provides inferencing, so you don't, there's a minimum amount of type annotations. Typically, you add type annotations at the entrance to your function. Um, it supports parametric polymorphism. Without going into the details of that, the benefits you saw with the array list. Um, another detail of the type framework is it's independent of the compiler. So the compiler uses the time framework, type framework, but they, they, they're, they're really separate, se 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 separate elements. And so all these names of types and things, as far as the type framework goes, you know, it has no knowledge that what's the difference between an integer and a Boolean. I mean, it, it just couldn't care less. It's only important when you actually make a concrete implementation and you write, have some actual code that, that, that these names mean something. Right. So, um, right. So, developing compiler in the wall from language. Compilers are not small, trivial things. Um, but there's some great advantages to working in the Wolfram language. And the, the other thing is, you know, building it in the Wolfram language, that's a great way to integrate that into our system and to get real benefits. So what are some, some things that we have here? So this, the, these are real things that we really do. So we need to visualize, like quite often, we're writing some code and something goes wrong with it. So the code is generated into this sort of output form that we can verify. It has like nice verification properties. And that, that 
make, 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 makes it work very nicely. But still, just knowing that something's broken, you have to figure out where it went wrong, that can be a bit challenging. So I've got a program here, it's got a branch and a loop. So what's, you know, and I can see the code there, but that can be a bit daunting sometimes. What's quite useful is to see a control flow graph. So in this control flow graph, I can print it like that, or actually, in this talk, sometimes it's better to write it, uh, orient it a little bit differently. It's the same, it's the same graph, um, and so just to run through this, we, come, we have a start, and then there's a branch, and the branch goes into two nodes, and then it goes, it goes into this loop, goes around this loop, and then it ends at the end. Yes? Is the IR that's a, a, a little bit above this green, is that, it, uh, is that the exact IR that LLVM might be using? Um, it's kind of isomorphic with it. It's an SSA, if, if you're familiar with what I mean by SSA, it's an SSA form. It's very similar to, it's not exactly the same. They have, we have slightly different instructions in, in the IR, but it's, 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 it, SSA, for everyone it stands for single static assignment, and you break, has several properties. You have blocks of code where you, you know, it breaks it into a control flow graph, the block of code, you enter at the top, exit at the bottom, and you have variables that only, are only ever assigned to once. A super interesting thing, and this will really bore most of you here, but is that you can fold the SSA inside out into a lambda, into a sequence of lambda um, functions. And actually, it's, there's interesting discussions about which form SSA form is suitable, or you can also compile a, 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 a lambda, you know, a lambda version, and that's, but we work with LLVM, and actually for the language that will, I think an SSA form is, is useful. The SSA property is very, is, is, is fantastic, because it's, it's very flexible and easy to work with, and it's very easy to detect, and it's very easy to prove that it's conforming, and that's, that, that makes this whole thing work correctly. So that's, that's. now, and just a, here's a more, um, this is, oh, hang on, what happened here? Here's more bigger examples. So I've got a table with two iterators. You know, again, the code, it gets, gets a little bit big and bulky. And then when you add memory management code, it gets even bigger and bulkier. But these control flow graphs are quite, they're quite useful. You can spot this. You can see where if, if something's got broken in the, you know, like you can't reach the end from the beginning, then because some, some optimization pass went a bit wrong and it deleted some link, that's, that's wrong, or it made a, um, a, a, a graph where there was a back edge going to the wrong place, that's, that, that, that would be bad. And you can spot potential for optimizations because you can start eliminating jumps. And in microprocessors, um, it's good to have, you know, you know, well, it, it depends what your goals are. You know, if you have a gigahertz processor, that's lots of instructions. But if you can start eliminating jumps, then then that 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 can be advantageous for your for your code. Um, so that's the um, control flow graph. It's fantastic in Wolfram language. I want to do, you know, I want to plot a graph. Well, hey, I just call graph plot. Isn't that, you know, I don't have to go and go to some other tool now. You know, that's, 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 that's pretty useful. Here's another visualization that we also use. So this is a different view into the code. Each of these visualizations is a little bit like an abstraction. You're lifting information. You're lifting something out of the code that you have to get some, some, some benefit, some insight. Throw away the details you don't care about. Focus on what you do care about. So. Often we need information about loops. So the aborting code doesn't add abort points at every instruction. It just adds abort points at the entrance to loops. So we need to know what, what and there's plenty of other things, need to know what the entrance to a loop is. Well, hey, guess, guess what? We have a pass that, um, that does this. So I've got, I've got some code here that has lots of loops. And I'm, I run the pass on it that 
computes the loop information, and I'm not going to print the IR out because it's a little bit tedious, but what I do get out is I get this loop information. This, this is also returning another data structure that we use to create the compiler that we'll be folding back into the data structure thing. So this says that from the root, there are three elements at, at the top. So there's the start and the end, but there's also a loop in the middle, and then you can drill down in, in this loop that reaches other loops. So you know that you know, the, the children of something are either a basic block or it's the beginning of a loop. So this is super useful, and we wrote a visualizer for this that gives us some, some insight. So there are three loops. So there's like three, one, two, three heads for these loops. So having this pass and things, we, we can visualize it and understand it. The IR for this is, you know, is quite, it's quite lengthy. Let me just point out, even though there's lots of IR, each line of IR is maybe one CPU instruction. And so it doesn't take a long time to execute that. So some of the CPU, in, you know, get, sort of get, get, get removed, of course. So that's, that's, that's kind of a useful thing. And using this, um, it, it means that the compiled code that we generate actually aborts better because we do this automatically. It aborts better than the built-in you know, MC code that people write by hand. So it's quite good doing things automatically. So anyway. Oh, I don't have a lot of time left, and I've come to the best part of my talk. Sorry about that. Right. I've been talking too much. Right. So this is annoying. I have to. I'm going to talk about iterators. And I've got a little animation here. Right. So this is iterators are a useful thing at least for container data structures. And what they do is they read elements at a time, passing them up to something else. And this is a great way of abstracting, working on um, you know, a great, great, great opportunity for abstraction. So I wrote some tools. So this is a package of stuff, and I'm sort of instantiating a bunch of functions that do things, and so I'm instantiating an array list of integers and some other things. So we, so I've got an array list and I'm appending a bunch of stuff to it, and I can see here are the elements. So in addition to this, I'm gonna have some iterators. So why are these important? Because a lot of real operations Things like that we build internally, things like map and select, are, are really written in a particular way. So here's, here's select. So what we do is we take an expression, and then we, we start, we make, a, we make an iterator out of it. Maybe it's a for loop or something. We make a stream that returns the elements. We pass that to a function that, um, you know, applies a predicate, and the ones that pass the predicate we pass on up, and then we collect those back into the expression. This is how select works. So why is working with iterators useful? So if we're doing two of these select operations, one after another, then we're creating a stream, selecting operations, turning it back into an expression. But what are we doing here? We're doing creating another stream, selecting items, and coming back. So, you know, great optimization, get rid of when you have adjacent streaming things, get rid of them. So here we have streaming, selecting from streaming. So, and then, in fact, if you have knowledge about the nature of the function, the predicate function, like it doesn't have side effects, which you do in a compiler, because you know you can study your code and you can answer questions about it, you could even compose these functions. You could reorder them. Supposing one of the functions got rid of lots of things and the other one didn't, you might want to run the selector that got rid of lots of things first, or one was more expensive. You, you could have some, some ideas based upon what, what they do. So you might even have an infinite stream, and you could do selecting on it and then from it. Or it could be a quasi-infinite stream. A quasi-infinite stream is a big is, is a big one. Right, fine. So 
infinite iterator, or we've got like a video stream type of thing. Now, let's come and have a quick look. I'm nearly finished. So I wrote these things. So these tools, and this creates things automatically from the, so I have an array list, and I've made an iterator. And the iterator just has, has it got a next function and give me the next function? So I can now, I can put this into a loop. So I've just cycled through and it's printing the output. So I have array list stream and I'm printing it. Now I'm taking those array list streams and I'm making a select iterator and there's the predicate. And so I can do the same thing. And this. And here, so now when I run this, it just shows me the even ones. The odd ones failed the predicate. They didn't get passed up. And this is why this is, this is what I'm kind of doing there. And, and actually, since I wrote this, I thought, you know, maybe we should just have create iterator and pass in a functional thing. And this would be completely, this, this would fit very naturally into, into this, this system. Of course, this select could be any function, and it would run super fast, okay, because this is compiled code. Then I can nest these things in again. So I've got one selector, and it's going into another one. So this has a different, a different predicate, and here we go. Look at this. So now when I do the running through the stream, it filters out the even ones, it filters out the ones divisible by three, and this is what gets, gets you know, sort of returned up. So, here's, here's another source of iterators, and this is a combinatorial one. So this is one that returns um, permutations, but it returns permutations one at a time. So here's the, I'm just showing this with some simple thing. So there's another permutation, and give me the next permutation, and if we have a look at this. So this is, we've, we've you know, permuted the thing, and I can cycle through all the permutations. I can also, slightly bigger one, and I wrote a function that sits again on top of this, and this is just a counting aggregator. So, so again, this counter is polymorphic. It's just getting a stream, and it's counting the things that come up until the stream has closed. So that's, 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 that's another useful sort of chain for this. So this is saying that there are, it counted 720, and at six factorial, it should be 720. So, so with this, I actually worked on permutations of 13. So the Built-in function generates everything. It couldn't do that. It would take over 600 gigabytes. But I was able to, to cycle through them and correctly count them in 20 minutes. And here, so this won't take long. I've nearly finished. So here I've got, an, uh, I've got a list of 65. So there are a very large number of permutations in this. It's more than the number of particles in the universe. But I can, so there we are, I've computed the first permutation. So I've switched, switched those, and I can keep on, keep on going. I started to work on other combinatorial things, subsets and so on. It's kind of nice to, to be able, so these are what I'd call quasi-infinite uh, um, iterators. So I think I'm coming to the end. Probably running out of time. Oh, yeah, another talk. Sorry about that. Right, uh, so I gave an introduction to the compiler and looked at some of the basic features. And then I started looking at some of the new features for 12.1, type product, way to create structures, and actual data structures that we've created and built in will be built into 12.1. So useful aspects for programming, useful teaching, data structure courses, etc. I looked at some of the internals of the compiler and, and I looked at how, in my opinion, Wolfram Language is perfect for compiler work. And then I looked at some interesting programming ideas for working with iterators. That might be good for data processing. You know, you're reading stuff from a database, and then you need to aggregate things and, and, and do things in some super optimized way, or for combinatorial um, combinations. And that's it. Thanks very much.